Hey folks, how's everybody doing? I'm just chilling here in the backyard because everywhere else <laughs> couldn't find a quiet place to talk to you guys. The babies are inside, they go inside like midday, it's so hot, cut the air count on, they watch some ABC songs and flashcards and all that. Just kind of chill out during the heat of the day. So, <laughs> so they're in there making a bunch of noise. And I said, you know what? The best place for me to get is the backyard. There ain't nobody outside. So I'm just chilling underneath the clothesline here. Coming to you live from the Philippines. Well, not really. Not live. Uh, I did a video. We did a video where we were watching Rafi Tulfo. We were talking about the young gentleman that lost 4.9 million pesos, which is just shy of 100,000 U.S. dollars on... Um, I don't even say a bad business deal. They basically scammed them from the get-go. Well, you could call it a bad business deal, but or whatever. And it's just the same tired story. That it just happens every day. And you can tell a million of these stories. Rafi Tulfo can tell these stories. And for some reason, us foreigners don't don't learn a lesson. We don't. Nobody learns a lesson. It's like people come over here whether it's the Philippines or anywhere in Southeast Asia for that matter. And they just lose all sense of business and um, they just turn from being cautious in their home country to just absolute naive, loose, nonchalant about handling business over here and their money. And so, you know, one of the things I've always done is I'm not afraid to air my dirty laundry so that younger guys can learn from my mistakes. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends are the same way, so I talk about their situations. If I hear a story in a bar, I put it out there. You know, don't name no names, but in the hopes that somebody watching my videos and listening to my voice, they learn something and they don't become a statistic like so many people over here. And um, again, I'll just speak on Southeast Asia. Uh, because that's where I've been for about 10 years. So I just thought about it and I was talking about what is a vanity business. And I made mention of that in the last video. And so I want to talk about that, but I sit down and made some notes. And, and folks, I never claim to be right. All I want to do is invoke thought. You know, I'm not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I'm not uh, involved in business here in the Philippines. I just know the people and I know the stories and, <laughs> you know, you just go sit in the bar for a week. You'll, you'll hear one of these stories from somebody, right? So it's just all too common. So I'm just here to invoke thought. And please, if you disagree, leave your, leave your disagreement or your agreement or your advice or your story or your buddy's story down in the comments so that others may learn. So I said, you know what, what are, what are like the four, the four types of business owners? Because I started to call it the four types of businesses, right? But if you like look up types of businesses, you know, they'll start talking about, you know, corporation, LLC, sole proprietorship. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to really the four types of business owners that I see over here and that I have seen over here. And again, this is not based on any, any science. This is just me and, and all the stories and the people I know and just put it together. And I said, you know, what? there's sort of like four types of business owners slash businesses. So let, let's start out with when you say the word business, right? Well, we'll start out with the first type of business. And you can call it a real business. All right? Just a real, actual business that is exactly what, it's, what it says. Now, what, what is a business? All right? Well, business is the practice of making one's living by engaging in commerce. Now, the business can be profit or non-profit. Non so let's leave nonprofits and charities out of this, right? I'm talking about the people who come over here or anywhere and they, they open a business 
what purpose is that business for? Unless you're running a nonprofit, your business is there to generate money. It's uh, whether you just invest money and you're expecting some type of return on your monetary investment or you're going to uh, be the owner operator of that business. And so everything you put into that business is, is going to be yours and it's going to be handed down hopefully to your children uh, and become a family business, a generational business. So, so the first type of business is, is a real legitimate business. Now, what does that consist of? Well, it consists of somebody who, now look, again, if you're, if you're at Harvard Business School right now, you're going to rip me up, right? Got it. I'm not talking about Harvard. But I'm talking about if somebody is starting a real business, what have they done? Okay, they didn't just go on the corner and rent the first place that was for rent and think that they're going to open a bar. It's not going to work. A real business owner, what's he done? He's looked around. He's done some market research. He's, uh, you know, checked into competition in the area. He's looking at traffic counts. He's looking at, uh, you know, the rent, the, the price per square feet. He's looking at... Um, renting versus buying he's he's analyzing all these things that you need to know to actually sit down write a business plan write a marketing plan you know kind of map map out your projections um, all these things that a legitimate business owner does before they start a business they have a business plan they have some type of business model in their mind that they're they're going to put all this to paper and and they have their shit together because they're serious about running the business they're they're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart they want a return on their investment and they want to make money they want to generate profit so i think we're all in agreement of what a what a real business is okay well when you come over to southeast asia you will see three other types of businesses that I'm about to discuss and this is all my opinion but in, in a decade th these are the types of businesses that I see okay let's start out with talking about what I call a vanity business now in Asia you know especially Thailand but really it's an Asian part of the culture in, in Thailand we call it face it's uh, in other words it's your reputation among the community among your your village your family your your town wherever you're from face is very important um, and I kind of connect this to like when you don't have a lot of money or if you have zero money what do you have? The only thing you have is your dignity, right? Your face, your reputation. And that's very important to you. So if you grow up like that, um, it's, it's something very important. And I, I tell people, I say, you know, like the, the people I know in Southeast Asia, they would rather you, you know, act physically beat them behind closed doors where nobody could see than for them to be embarrassed in public, right? And it's just a difference in culture. In the U.S., you know, I, I was grown up, I grew up and I was taught, hey, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You can say anything you want to me. I don't give a shit. But in the Asian culture, it's quite different, especially if you say something or do something to cause a person to lose face out in public. It's detrimental, right? So with that, what I've seen is that a lot of foreign guys They'll marry girls from Southeast Asia, and it's all about the face game. I want, you know, they want you to build their family a house in the village. Why? Because now the family is elevated in their reputation in the village. Oh, look at me. We raised a beautiful daughter. She's a wonderful girl. She's providing. She built us a new house. Take it one step further. Now they want a car. Why? Everybody drives by. There's a brand new car in the driveway. Oh my God, they're rich. They got a car. Because a lot of people over here don't have cars. They have motorbikes. Some of them don't even have that, right? 
What's the next thing they want? It's especially prevalent in Thailand because the Thai girls, they, they want it all. They, you're going to build them a house, build their mother a house, you're going to buy a new car. Then they want a business. Okay? And this is where I, I call it a vanity business. They want a business not because they want to generate money or because they want to get up and go to work every day and work 12 to 14 hours and generate a profit. No, that's not what they want because they're married to you, the rich foreign guy who provides. They want the vanity business for show. It's to elevate face, standing, reputation in the village, in the small town, what have you. That's why they want it. They don't want to go to work every day. Why do they want, want to do that? They, they're, they're married to a, what they perceive to be a rich foreign guy. They don't have to. They want that business so everybody in the village is like, oh, my God, look at her. She's a business owner. Oh, my God, she built on my house. She's this. Now she's a businesswoman. And so what I've seen, especially in, say, say the girl lives in the city, the foreign guy will spend a lot of money on this this business, this vanity business. So say uh, it's a salon. You know, rent a place, buy a place, build out the salon. It's absolutely gorgeous in there. It's a beautiful, big old sign. She's got business cards and all this stuff. And so in all, in all appearances, it looks like, oh, she's running a successful business. The reality is the business never opens. It's just there for show. And I've seen this personally. I'm not making this shit up. And what happens is, say they live in Bangkok or wherever, and then visitors come down from the village. Well, then they'll open up the business, you know, clean the dust out, put two or three of her friends in there to act like they're working, whatever. The people from the village are there for a week or two visiting, and they'll come visit the, 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 the business. Oh, she's a beautiful, uh, a successful business lady. And then they go back home to the village and tell everybody, oh, she's a big rich lady down in Bangkok. She's got a big business, blah, blah, blah. Well, the minute the family from the village leaves, the business closes the doors and they lock it back up. It's, it's not designed to generate money. It's there for what? It's there to raise her status, her face in the village and among uh, her family, friends, and peers. And so that's what I call a vanity business. It's the same way with vanity publishing. A lot of people will, you know, just write a manuscript and then go pay uh, to have 500 copies printed. They pay for everything because their intent is not to sell the book or to generate a profit. They're just doing it like to hand out business cards. They hand those books out like business cards. It, it gives them uh, credibility in the field that they're in. Uh, you know, I mean, any field. Say you're a plumber, right? You're going around trying to drum up business instead of a business card. Yeah, I wrote this book on how to, you know, uh, you know, uh, install plumbing in a two-story house or whatever. And like, oh shit, this guy wrote a book. He must know what he's talking about. That's that's a vanity published book. Never intended to uh, to compete with, you know, any other book out there. It's just. To give the author, the the person who created it, credibility in their field, they call it vanity publishing. So that's what they're doing here. What I've seen personally is a lot of guys just basically creating a vanity business. So their Thai wife, their Filipino wife, their Cambodian wife, whoever can brag back in the village. She doesn't go to work every day. She, matter of fact, nobody goes to work every day in most of them. Some of them will operate and just keep taking a loss and taking a loss. Um, you know, say, say they open it up in the village. Well, they have, to, they have to open every day to maintain the perception, to fake the phone. So the foreign guy, every month, is just pouring money into it just to make his wife look nice. It's, it's never designed to, uh, to make any money. So that's what a vanity business is. What type of guy is a vanity business owner? It's a dude with, with a lot of money a lot of disposable money. It's rich guys who do this, right? Because they can sustain it. If they've got a lot of money, why do they care if they shell out some bones to make their wife happy and make her feel important? They don't care, okay? So, you know, but guys who are coming over here on a pension with 
thousand dollars in their saving retirement 401k whatever they can't afford to put up a vanity business for their old lady because it continually takes money to pump money in there because it's never going to make a profit it was not designed to make a profit it's basically like a play it's a show it's a movie so unless you're a very rich dude you probably you know you don't have any idea what i'm talking about but some of you guys with money you know exactly what i'm talking about and you don't care it's easier just to pay the money make your old lady and her family happy that they're they're big important business owners now and it's just a little money out of your pocket they leave you alone you can go to the bars and go play golf got it it's your money i'm not telling anybody any man how to spend his money but but there you go so the vanity businesses just for show uh, rich dudes can fund that all right probably if you're listening to my voice you are not <laughs> i don't want to say that because there's some there's a there's Various folks here on my channel. I don't want to say that. I'm just going to maintain that you have to be very well off to maintain that vanity business because it's an expensive uh, piece of jewelry for your old lady, right? It's like the, a big diamond on her finger, right? Okay, so moving right along, um, let's see. What's the other type of business owner? Okay, now... I see a lot of this because a lot more people can support this. It's called a hobby business owner. All right, and now some of you listen to my voice, you might be a hobby business owner. So what, what's a hobby business owner, right? So a hobby business, if you look at the definition, it's a business that's operated more for pleasure than profit. Now, I would say that a hobby business has the potential to make money and you're trying to get that thing to make money because that's your hobby. Your, it's a hobby for you to try to make money. Now, you know, you have a pension, you have a little bit of savings, you're, you're taking a little bit of money out of your savings to start this business, you know, thinking, oh, I'll make an extra, I'll make an extra, you know, 500 bucks a month and then, you know, my wife doesn't have to come get in my pockets. Uh, she can employ her family, this and that. And with the hobby business, you know it's usually on a smaller scale and you're pumping money into it but in your mind you're gonna get that back or your wife's gonna have a business to run if you kick out or she's gonna start making profit and then you don't have to pull money out of your pocket to send to her family every month so the the hobby business has less planning you know it's usually you sitting around in a bar and you're like eh, I'm gonna open up uh, I don't know, pick something, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to open up a, a mango stand or a small sorry sorry store. Or I'm going to open up a laundry or, or something like that, right? No real business plan because it don't take a whole lot of money to get get into it. A few permits from the barong guy. You rent a place and you're, you're open, you know, in two weeks. So this business actually has a chance to generate a profit, but... Most people, most Western dudes, if they're honest with you, in the end, they never turn a profit. They never turn a profit. Say you put 20000 into a business here. That is big, big money that could support your ass for, for you know, a, a year, year and a half. I mean, if you really budget your money, $20,000 can support you living here for quite some time. So you say you put twenty thousand into a business, and most of these smaller businesses, their profit margin is this big. How long is it going to take you to make that money back? And it's such a long time because it's such a small profit margin that you'll never make that money back. You'll be dead before you you make a profit. That's just what I've seen. You know, you go to a sorry, sorry store, and if you know somebody, just ask them how much how much profit is on this right here. You know, it's one peso, two pennies, and and you're sitting there and you look at what a low profit margin it is. You still got to pay the rent. You have to you know pay an employee or your wife's family or whoever. Then your wife's family is in there eating the damn chips when you're not looking. Really, how long is it going to take you to make that that money back? So I call it a hobby business. It gives you something to do because you're bored over here. You have all these great ideas and these great projections. 
But in reality, in reality, if you truly wanted to make money, I'm, uh, you know, maybe if you're, you know, mid 70s and up, it's not an option. But you know, anybody 70 and under, hell, you could go back to the states and be a door greeter at Walmart for three months, and you're going to make more money than that little business is going to make in two or three years. It doesn't make any sense because the profit margin is so low. Um, or you could get a part-time job doing customer service from a, from a phone line in your laptop and in one month make more than that Sorry Sorry store is going to make in a year. And it's solid money. Um, so that's sort of what I consider a, a hobby business. Now, again, it, it's not the rich dudes that are doing a hobby business. It's the people that come over here with, you know, with your pension, you got a little bit of extra disposable income. Let's say you got 3000 a month and your bills are two. And you're like, well, I'll just take this extra money, pump it into this business, get that thing running and profitable, and now I don't have to send money home to the village. I think most of you are going to, figure out real quick if you're honest with yourself it's not happening it's not gonna happen if you need extra money get on the computer get get on get a job that says work remote in other words you need a telephone to answer some customer service questions what you make in one month is gonna be more than that little business here is gonna make in two years okay um, that's just that's just my opinion okay now as talk about a couple other things okay before I get to the last the last type of business owner opening a business in any country that's not your own you have things that are against you and take this place for example right any or anywhere in Southeast Asia do you know <laughs> Uh, you, you don't know the law of the land. You don't know the local politics. You don't know how things really are. You have this perception in your mind of how business here operates, but it's based on your home country, wherever that may be. I'm assuming it's in the West, right? When you get outside the West, you're not familiar with the law of the land. And I don't need to bring up any specific terms, but you know, in the West, it's pretty quite clear about what taxes you're going to pay, and this is what you, you know what you're going to pay. And when you get out of the West, there are some other bills that you may have to pay that you have no idea exist because you're not familiar with that country. You're not from there, so you already have everything stacked against you. You you're, you're not familiar with the law. You don't know the legal system. You don't know, uh, you know, how the tax system works. And if you're one of those dudes that's just going to sit there and, and say, oh, let's, let's start a business. And the next day you go run a place, you really don't know what you're getting into, right? And so are you really going to make a profit? Hey, I hope you do. But all the people I know, they ain't never made no damn dime, okay? So the vanity guys, they know it going into it because they're rich and they're smart. They're doing it to keep their wife happy and quiet, okay? The guys who are legitimate business owners who have experience running businesses, they've already done the research. They have local partners. They have contracts. They have funding. They're coming in to open a legitimate business, and they know what they're getting into. They know what they have to pay, and they know who they have to pay. Okay, then you drop down to the hobby business owners. Uh, <laughs> not a lot of planning, a little bit of money goes into it, and, and you think you're going to get a return on your investment on, uh, on a sorry, sorry store in your wife's hometown. Let's get to the fourth business owner. I, I was struggling to come up with a name for these folks, but... The only thing that popped in my, my mind is the pipe dream. The pipe dreamers. The absolute pipe dreamers that somehow or another have squirreled away some money 
in their home country. You know, they roll over here with 100 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand, somewhere in there. And they have this pipe dream about opening up a go-go bar or this place on the beach or what have you and just making money hand over over fist or over foot, whatever the saying is, right? And they're thinking like, they're thinking like, oh, you know, I could, I went down to Florida and, you know, this place called uh, Pompano Joe's. Man, I'm going to do that same shit over there on the beach. <laughs> it's not the same. And so they have this pipe dream, but they've never run a business before. And here they come. Here they come. And folks in this region have seen them before. They've been coming over here every day since the, the beginning of foreigners coming over here, right? And they're just like sharks circling, just waiting for this idiot to start talking about starting a business or whatever, and they got all the answers for you. And you're going to dream about opening up this place on the beach. It's only going to take 200 grand. You're going to recoup. you got all these big plans, but you ain't never run a business before. Never even worked in a hotel or a bar or a restaurant, you know. Whatever you did back in the West has nothing to do with running a business on your own. You have no experience. And the next thing you know, you're hooked up with a bunch of people here telling you to do this, do that, do that. You trust them. Next thing you know, what happens? You've lost all your money. They have bought the land, put it in their name. There's no contract. You don't have a lawyer because they told you you don't need a lawyer or they're using their lawyer. Um, and everything is just an absolute pipe dream because you don't know what the hell you're doing and you don't know what the hell you're getting yourself into. When in actuality, if you just take that 100, 200, 300 grand, keep it in the bank and live off of it, you can live for years over here on that. Or better yet, invest that in something in your home country where you get a monthly return, dividend, whatever, whatever you can get into because you can live cheap over here. And if, if you got 300 grand to invest uh, with a little bit of help, that's all you need. And you can come over here and live off of what, what you've got invested and just enjoy yourself and enjoy life. The last thing you should do is think about coming to Southeast Asia and opening a business for the average person, right? Okay, now let me go back and, and caveat that. Remember when I said, I'm not talking about if you're a Harvard business graduate or if you're with, uh, you know, Sony or stuff like that. That's big business, folks. Those aren't the people that are getting scammed and that's not the reason or the purpose for these videos. The people getting scammed are the people in that category of hey I got a pension I got a pension every month with 150 grand in the bank or I've got you know no pension but I got 250 grand I have to come over there and invest in a business those are the type of people that are losing all their their money and I'm not saying that people haven't lost more than that because they have but that demographic of folks like I'd say the 150 the 150 to $300,000 player, the people that have the, that type of cash on hands, you're the ones who get wiped out. You come here with 300 grand, a year or two later, your, your ass is trying to borrow money to get on a plane and head back to where you came from. Don't have to be that way. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, if you're smart about it. It's a great place to live, great place to uh, enjoy yourself. But in my opinion, for 99.999% of you, this is not a place for you to start a business. And probably 80% of y'all, the U.S. is not a place to start a business. Because whatever industry you came from, you weren't a business, business owner. Okay, if you work for a plumbing company, that's totally different than running the plumbing, plumbing company. If you are a truck driver, that's totally different than owning and operating a trucking business. You know, I go back to talking about the pig farms. How many people come over here and buy fucking pig farms, but they ain't never seen a pig before? Closest they got to a pig was the damn meat section at Kroger. But you 
you could think you're gonna come over here with your 100 grand and start a pig farm. You don't know what the hell you're doing. There are people here running pig farms and you need to talk to them and, and they're the experts. Don't talk to me about it, but if, if you're thinking about coming over here and starting a pig farm, hell, go on YouTube or whatever and research these guys who are doing it and talk to them first. But if you ain't never seen a pig before in your home country, I don't think you're qualified to run a fucking pig farm. Okay? If you ain't never run a fucking bar before in your home country, or even at least at least worked at the bar, or at least managed the bar, what makes you think you're gonna come over here with your 200 grand and run a successful bar. Uh, but dudes do it. And why do they do it? Well, it goes back to the hobby business owner. The hobby business owner has that pension. He's got between 100 and 3, maybe a little more, puts it into a bar. It's his hobby. He thinks he's going to make money, but he's got that pension coming in. He'll survive. Even if the business or when the business goes down, he still got his pension. He could still live here. Uh, but he's still going to lose the money. The pipe dreamers, those are the dudes, they lose everything and they got to get the hell out. Go back to work. Go back to their home country and figure it out. Figure out what happened. So I don't know. I don't know if a lot of this made sense. But like I said, a lot of things I do here, I'm just trying to air the older generation's dirty laundry so the younger cats coming over don't fall into the same trap and you know it's embarrassing when you lose money or you make bad business decisions but we old dudes if we don't share them with these young cats they're just going to go down the same path and it's a it's just a cycle yeah you know it goes right up there to, to building the house and your wife or your girlfriend's village as long as you understand that's play money that's gambling money. That's money you will never get back. You will never live in that house if you and your wife split up. It's guaranteed. As long as you're okay with that and you have enough money, by all means, go go build your wife or your bar girl girlfriend and her family. Go build them a house. They'll love you for it. But I'll just give an example. If you have $10 million in the bank, go spend 50000 and build a girl a new house. Because if she leaves you the next day, who gives a shit? That's a scratch. If you have a hundred thousand in the bank, you don't build nobody a fucking house because you don't have enough money to be building people's houses. And I'd take that all the, all the way up to three hundred thousand. You got three hundred thousand in the bank, you ain't got enough to be building people houses. That's just my opinion. Because if if shit goes south, and all of a sudden you're you're on your own. You're going to need that money. Too many dudes. Too many dudes. I'm here in Angeles City, and there's plenty of these stories around. Too many dudes have went to their wife's village, started a business, built a house, whatever. They booted them out, and they had to borrow money to get a fucking $60 Cebu Pacific flight to get back to Angeles City, sleep on their buddy's couch for a month until they get their new Social Security check, and then start over with zero money at 65 years old. <laughs> yeah, you can't make this shit up you can't make this shit up so all I can do is put the information out there you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink uh, but there comes a time when silence is betrayal and I'm not that type of dude that's why I put this shit out there what else can I say to recap one last time and I'll close out the video if you're a millionaire, you can afford a vanity business. Um, legitimate business guys, I'm not talking to you. I'm really talking to the pleasure, the, the hobby business owners who probably will never generate any money and lose their money, but they, it's a hobby. It's an expensive hobby that you're engaging in. And then you got the pipe dreamers who are going to lose it all. So, uh, there you go. I'd like to hear your thoughts down in the comments. Share your story, whatever. Maybe help somebody else out. But, I think any business owner will tell you, owning and operating a startup business takes a lot of work. And it's difficult enough 
in a region that you know that you have rights and a market that you understand it's already tough enough there here you come with no business experience and you're gonna run a successful business and make money in Southeast Asia who uh, good luck to you there's other ways to make money where you can keep your savings account intact and, li and live a great life there any questions <laughs> folks you're not a subscriber on my channel right there is a little overstay road sign if you'll hit that overstay road sign then something about a bell is going to pop up you ring that bell like rocky yo adrian it's me rocky i want to start a bit i want to start a business in the philippines <laughs> just ring the bell i'll see you guys on the next one peace out